Greetings, darklings, from across the interwebs. It is I, the Duchess, Precious Ken, once again here in my cat cave. And I have with me this time my dear friend and compatriot. I'm going by K-pop now. I like it. I like it. That's nice. <laughs> Today we have a really exciting guest, somebody who, wow, in my most formative goth years when I was 18 or 19, created an album called Liquid, which was quintessential to me at that juncture. And I must have played until the scratches on it became so severe in my car CD player that I had to rebuy it just to keep playing it again. Carolyn Blind of the band Sunshine Blind. Hello, Carolyn. It is so good to have you with us. Hi, Ken. Nice to see you again. I want to start out talking about, as I said, your, I think your history and contribution really meant a lot to the scene that is important to me. And so why don't you start out for maybe some of our younger listeners that didn't join in to dark music until a little bit later. How did the band start? Who were the original people that you started doing it with? How did Sunshine Blind come into being? <clears throat> well, um, we started in New Jersey in 1991. We played around the New Jersey and uh, New York scenes. It was myself and the, the guitarist, CWHK. We kind of formed the root of it. We were a trio for a while. We had another bass player, Cousin L. Yeah, how did we even get together? I think it was like an ad in a paper, you know, the way people get together. Friend of a friend, all that stuff. Remember back when that happened? <laughs> Remember back when you had to put an ad in the back of the Music Weekly? Yes. So I, I liked his guitar playing. He liked my voice. We started writing music. We found out immediately that it was too slow to play live because people would fall asleep. So we kicked it up a notch. And so uh, we did our first album probably in 1992, 93. Love This Guy to Death. We started playing a lot with uh, you know, all the great bands at that time that were in New York City, all the bands we knew, that was really a good time. Just started going to shows further and further out, went to Philadelphia, went to North Carolina, went to Boston, came back and then just you know, kept going from there. We used to send out those demo tapes you know, that you like make in your room and had three songs and would mail them out to all the zines. This is way back before the internet, kids. Yeah, just started getting well known better known anyway, got reviews and that sort of thing. Well, you know, how, how you do it, you promote yourself. Went good. Yeah. We, got a, we got a guy who had a little label in New Hampshire and he signed us for that album and for the, so he signed us for the first album and he shopped us around to bigger labels. And so Liquid, which you were just talking about, was out on Energy Records out of New York City and they bought our contract yes. ish through, yeah. So we were on that label with Hansel and Gretel and Propane and uh, a couple other people. Then in 1994, we decided to move to San Francisco. So we left New Jersey, moved to San Francisco, but really we just kept touring. So we didn't really get to know San Francisco very well until much later. Probably anybody could barely afford a room there. It's true. Even then, it's true. And uh, yeah, we just kept touring incessantly until that whole <laughs> Sisters of Mercy thing. So, <clears throat> And then our label went under. We ran out of money. There was no touring after that. So... We sat in San Francisco and we, we did some recording, but we didn't release our third album until 2003. Yep. Yeah. And that was I Carry You, right? I Carry You, yeah. And then we pretty much broke up after that. So, yeah. So it's been a long time. I've been um, busy. <laughs> I've been busy, but... Um, it, I, it has. It has. <laughs> yeah, it goes by quick, you know, when you're doing things and working and trying to make a living and uh you know we didn't have a record label anymore and it didn't occur to me until like a year or two yeah. ago i could have just called another record label and you know but these are the things that hindsight's 2020 but uh, who knew um because we had everything going for us at the time so you know it's been a long break since then and uh i've been really trying yeah. to get, been truly really trying to get sunshine blind to do some live shows and play some festivals and stuff like that and it wasn't happening i mean we did convergence in chicago we did convergence 20 because we had played the first three as well so they called us to reunite for convergence 20 in chicago which we did and uh we did it again in detroit did you see us in detroit yeah yeah i did and it was awesome <laughs> begrudgingly i started doing looking into doing solo stuff yeah that's that's what i wanted to touch on next because 
you finally, this last year, came out with a new album, The Spell Between, um, which I absolutely adored. Um, I played a lot, and it was just such... The things that I loved about Sunshine Blind, but also just something completely different, something more organic, something I, with a lot more rock feel to it, really, whereas Sunshine Blind, to me, I always thought of it as one of my early forays into electronica, you know, because a lot of the, you know, there were rock elements to it, but a lot of electronica was featured and it had a very dancey beat. And the spell between just was all power, passion, and kind of carried on you. And I know you had other people that you brought in for doing it. And I want to talk about some of those, but before that, so with that long a hiatus, what adventure did you go on between 2003 and then this last year coming out with the Carolyn Blind solo album? Well, like I said, in 1997, our record label went under, so we didn't have any money. We were way in debt from touring, way too much. So we just had to stop. We had to stop everything and just get jobs and, yeah. and stay home and, you know, have kids and raise kids. And that's what we've been doing. So I've been trying to, you know, we tried to get some music going, like I said. So I Carry You came out in 2003. That was in the middle of it. And then after that, after that, it was like trying to find people to work with because I knew my bandmates weren't going to do it anymore. And I was tired of like trying to, you know, get blood from a stone as far as it was. So sure. like I said, begrudgingly, and I really, you know, I don't like working as a solo artist and I really like to work with people, hopefully, you know, one person, but more if I have to. So that was it. I had to, I had, I just reached out. It was a time, like a couple of years ago, like everybody started doing stuff again, right? I don't know what happened, but everybody there, had the same true. idea at the same time. And I got in touch with everybody, you know, through social media and uh, they put me in touch with other people. I started reconnecting with the old bands that we had known, like George from Switchblade Symphony and the guys in the wake. Yeah. And I was just like, Hey, I'm trying to get this thing going. And you know, can you help me out? And they, they did. So much to their credit, and I'm so thankful. And and I think we really nailed some, you know, some pent up stuff that I'd wanted to get out for a long time. So yeah. So you bring that up, and, and that's the next place that I want to go with it. So I saw you play with Stoneburner. I was just talking to Stephen about you the other night, letting him know we were going to do this, and and he was telling me his very first show with Ego Likeness was opening for you guys back in Washington. <laughs> You had George with you, and uh, what was the, the guy from The Wake again? Uh, the guys who were with me when I saw you were George from Switchblade Symphony and Dave the Dramedy. Oh, yeah, Dave, okay. So you, you put this back together with two, I mean, that was really cool to see too, because I always associated you guys a lot with Switchblade Symphony, um, you know, same kind of time period. And what, what kind of brought it together that then this album came out and how did, who were some of the people that contributed to putting it together with you? Well, when I started, like I said, I thought it would be a solo album. So I was learning how to use software. I was learning to use Pro Tools actually. As I was, I was taking a class in Pro Tools and I was learning it and I, you know, I wanted to put some stuff down and I thought the easiest stuff would be, you know, voice and guitar. That's the easiest thing. Just throw it down and then I could, you know, practice all the other stuff on it. And of course, cover songs came to mind immediately. And, you know, the first two that came to mind were the, the Red Lori, Yellow Lori song, Heaven, and um, yeah. Swan's song, uh, Goddamn the Sun. Goddamn the Sun was first. And I did it, you know, I did a version of it and I put it up and uh, Rich from The Wake saw it and he was like, hey, do you want to work on some, some stuff? And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> you know, of course. <laughs> I mean, no. Yeah. Why would I want to do that? You know, The Wake being a band that we've, you know, we've played with and toured with, and, you know, we have common members in common and, uh, you know, over the years. So, of course, of course, that's like perfect. That seemed like the perfect thing. And uh, he and I traded files because he's in Ohio and I was in San Francisco. We traded files. We worked on, you know, a couple of the cover songs. We uh, tried writing some stuff, which was fantastic. And uh, yeah, it just started from there. And then he told, he told David Wolfenden from Red Lorry, Yellow Lorry, that we were covering a song without telling me I'm my dad. <laughs> you know how I feel about like Andrew Eldridge kicking me off the bill and stuff like that. So I was really paranoid. So you actually, you're doing a Red Yellow Lorry song and you have, Dave, come on, who is a member of it, that actually joins up with you to work with you on you covering a song. 
what does that feel like? <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, Rich and I did a, a version of the song. And we, you know, played with it for a while and we were like, yeah, that's perfect. I'm like, sweet, that's perfect. So went to sleep, woke up the next morning. He's like, yeah, I sent it to Dave. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> why did you do that? Why didn't you even tell me? He didn't even tell me. Fortunately, David Wolf didn't like it. And Rich asked him if he'd play on it. And he said, yes. So shocking, shocking to say the least. Like I said, you know, my, my experience hasn't been good in dealing with my idols so it's actually been a, a reparative uh experience <laughs> that that would have to bring you back now i i love that cover of heaven and it's a great song but the swans cover of goddamn the sun to me the first time i heard it i absolutely lost my shit it just it was such a different tone and direction for the song and and i really feel it's one of those times like when you hear a cover and it almost takes on different meaning because of the lens that it's coming through. And I felt like that was such the power of it. It just inflection in the way you delivered some lines, which, I mean, to me, the Swans are one of those bands that actually just cheer me up. Like whatever I'm going through, if I'm down or depressed or something, I put on the Swans <laughs> and I say to myself, okay, like I'm, I'm going through a tough time right now, but I'm not ready to scream goddamn the sun into the sky. I'm going through a tough time right now, but I'm not pushing the stone up the hill of failure at this moment. Whatever I'm going through, it isn't that. And therefore, I must be okay. <laughs> but that cover just absolutely, <laughs> the emotion captured it. But I wondered when you were singing it, were you truly in that swan's moment? Or were you kind of tongue in cheek when you were delivering it? <laughs> no, never. Of course not. I mean, those songs mean a lot to me. They're, you know, those are the songs I was listening to in 1991 and 92 when we formed Sunshine Blind. And Goddamn the Sun being the first one that I did by myself on my own Pro Tools rig. It was super emotional at the time. Yeah. And uh, it was just like I had all this pent up stuff that I had to get out. So it just came through in the vocal. It was, I think I cried as well. I, I could really feel that when it was going through, and it did. I, to me, that's just it. I almost felt like the swans, when they delivered it, were more tongue-in-cheek. And when I heard your version, it seemed genuine and serious, <laughs> which was awesome for a cover. So The fact that you know both the originals have uh, vocals that are kind of hard to discern, like you can't really tell the lyrics because the way they sing them, and to make yeah. them like really clear so you could understand the lyrics was important to me, so... That's one of the things I tried to do. Yeah, because, I mean, that's both those songs have great lyrics on it. I know you also had Ash Rupe on there from Delphine Coma, yeah. right? Didn't he play on yeah. the record as well? He did. I love that guy. I, <laughs> that guy is just awesome. Me um, too. We got in touch. I, he is, I, I, and I really... You've been in touch with him, and we got in touch again, and I was like, you have to play on this album. And then I just found the right song for him to do, and... He kicked it back in like a day. I was like, okay, let's, we're, we'll mix it. It's good. You know, I think that's another thing that's just so interesting and cool. You know, you talked about back in the day, like making mixtapes and sending them out to zines and like what promotion used to be. And nowadays you can be sitting in San Francisco, send a track over to London, you know, to the wig or, you know, over to Ash or and you just get that opportunity to make a connection like that. And what other time in music did we really get away with doing something like that? I, I, there was just so many other people on it. Too. You had Gordon Young on there, right? Yeah. Who I love, Pretentious Moi. That, I mean, that is yes. just an incredible band. I love them. And you had William Faith of Bellwether Syndicate, who... I mean, just him and Sarah are just the greatest humans. I, I just love them as people. But, like, their band is just so good, too. And I kind of say, like, especially nowadays when you're talking about somebody who's been in the scene for a long time, when you see William play live, like, I look up on that stage and I say, that's what a rock star is supposed to look like. You know what I mean? Like, he just he has that <laughs> energy and that look that when I see, I'm just like, when I think of rock star in my mind, I think of what William looks like up on stage. Yeah. Just the attitude. Agreed. He's got it down. <laughs> and he's someone I've known forever as well. We did a tour in 96 uh, with Faith in the Muse and uh, known him since before that, probably. 
All right. Sorry, I, I really gushed and got excited there. Katie, do you want to jump in? Do you have questions that you would like to ask to Carolyn so I don't hog the whole thing? Circling back to the cover, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you sing the song so passionately, and hearing your backstory from you was very emotional just to hear it. During the Goddamn the Sun, is there something specific that you brought into the studio with you that day when you were laying down your lyrics that you were able to like turn to you to get that emotion up? Uh, you know, the whole thing is about loss and, uh, I don't know, regrets. And also, you know, it talks about the past, like how the past was and how it is now. So all of that, you know, really touched on what I was doing at that time, which was, you know, kind of pulling on the past, which is, you know, the music I wanted to do and, you know, what a release it was to actually be able to do it and to be doing it and to know that, you know, this was the opening of the door and this, this was the beginning of the album and I was going to be able to express myself once again. And so I just really connected with it. It seems like you're doing a lot of DIY things like getting into Pro Tools and recording this album. And it, are you making your own mu music videos too? I am. I even edit them. <laughs> I've had some help with the shooting, but um, the videos are very fun. I've, I've made a couple, I've made three, about three of them now, and it's super fun and creative. And yeah, I, I, I am kind of learning the software as I go. I find it, I find it really super fun and I'm going to make videos for everything. <laughs> And yes, I've got to do everything my goddamn. I'm going to do it my goddamn. So <laughs> it is so much fun. And it's like so much easier now to be able to get that equipment and that software and do it from home. Only the rendering time is annoying. Yeah. I mean, especially now working from home on your own stuff. It's, I mean, we're all locked in. So perfect time. Speaking <laughs> of your music videos in heaven, I noticed that there was a church that you were using in some of your shots. Like, how did you get access to a church during lockdown? <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> There's these websites you can just go to and get and get stock footage. So um, that was on there. And, you know, I, I played with it. I zoomed in on it. I keyed it. So it was, you know, solarized. It's all black. You know, it's reverse colored. To reverse the colors on the stained glass looks amazing. Yeah, a lot of that stuff is, uh, is just stock stock footage that you can download from the internet. I felt like, I it was funny, I was using like, trying to use all the icono iconography that you would use for, you know, what people think of heaven. There's a lot of religious stuff in there. And kind of, you know, played with the black and light. And, you know, it's, it's fun to, you know, work with the themes and the imagery and the, you know, the, uh, what do you call it? The archetypes that uh, go into a video. And if it's a song I wrote, then obviously, you know, I know what it's about and I can either, you know, express that or, or deflect so people don't know what it's about. <laughs> you recently moved and you released this album. You've released a few music videos, none of which I think you were planning on doing during a lockdown, right? Yeah, well, actually everything, all the music, all the videos pretty much were, except for the last one, were done before the lockdown, which I feel so fortunate about because I did, I got the album out the album officially came out March 20th, which was like the day of the lockdown. Before that, I got I got all those shows in. I got to see Ken over there in Detroit. And yeah, we went to Mexico City. We went to, we did all these shows, went to Portland. We went to Pittsburgh. You know, I'm so I'm so fortunate that we got especially Mexico City because I'd never been so fortunate. We got all that in. And I was it was funny because I was just like, wow, this is a lot of work. I don't know if I can do this anymore. <laughs> and then it was like the lockdown is like you can't. You can't go anywhere. So I was like, wow, that was really good timing for me. I mean, the album took like two years to make. So to have it done and out and, it, you know, it's done months before you release it, like done, like mastered and, you know, off to be made into CD. It was done, you know, in February or something like that came out in March. Perfect timing for me. Okay. I'll ask one last question and then turn it back to Ken. This one's a little bit more fun, I think. As a professional tourer, so to speak, where do you think the best tour location is? The best tour location? Ooh. You mean like tour stop when you're out on the road? The, the, your favorite city to go play, right? Oh, man. Yeah. It could be a small town, too. Whatever floats your boat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think anybody who tours will tell you that small towns are really good because there's no competition and you get like really good crowds. That's why you should come to Kalamazoo. 
Well, I tried. <laughs> we tried. I, I remember the last tour. I kept I kept calling you like, "Oh, we need a show in Chicago." I know. Or something. I know. We couldn't we couldn't figure it out. There was nothing. What was up with that? Yeah. Tried to get one in Ohio. Nothing. Now it seems like that would be so simple back then. I was like, "Wow, why didn't I just book all the shows?" Now there are none to have. <laughs> Yeah, well, now I'm really worried because, you know, they say that lots of the independent venues are just going to be gone. Like 90% of independent venues are just going to be gone, gone, gone. And it's very, very worrying for anybody who wants to, you know, tour. When you were going on tour more, like, was there a city that you liked to frequent more than others? Uh, it's, hard, it's hard to say because, I mean, there's, there's certain cities I like and don't like and has nothing to do with music. Like, I don't like Chicago personally uh, as a city to go to and visit. But uh, I've got, you know, William and Sarah are there and, you know, yeah. I've got tons of great friends there. So as a person on tour, the best place, the best cities are the ones that offer you the best hospitality, <laughs> really. Those are your favorite because, you know, it's kind of sparse out on the road. How many, how many nights in a row can you eat pizza? You know, it's like, hey, you know, I came up in the New York City scene. So I, I love New York. I like L.A. I like playing Chicago. It's been a while since I've done a full nationwide tour. You know, like the, the shows I've played recently are kind of been one-offs. I'm a big Anglophile, so anywhere in the UK has always been great for me. We played London quite a few times and had such a great response. We played Whitby a couple times, 97 and 98. We played with Rosetta Stone, I think in 97 or 98. We had a great time. So I, I love going to the UK. I've never played shows in Europe. I think we did like a tiny one in Italy and somewhere around there. I, I don't even remember. So, I mean, the UK is my favorite place, bar none, for everything. So... It would probably be London is probably be my favorite place to play. Or Edinburgh. <laughs> I like Edinburgh too. We played a show. Or Edinburgh, there. yeah. Fantastic. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna shift back. <laughs> shift back over Fire to the record. We talked about some of the covers that you've done on the record, but to me, the first song when I heard it on this record that really just melted me was well, actually. Is this is a cover song too, isn't it? Of first, right? Right. Yes. By the wake, yeah. Okay. I, this was the one. I mean, that I didn't know of as a cover before I heard it. Before I heard your version, I didn't figure that out until later. Okay. But it just, holy fuck, is this just an intense song? Like, I'm, I'm seriously. It's one of those songs where, like, can make you misty just listening to it like that's how deep the the intensity of it was and you i know work with them and get to play with them what was it like to try and take on that song and spin some of the flavor to make it your own a little bit or put some kind of your own stamp on it on a song that i, I don't know to me like you'd have to be in touch with the emotional concept of this song to deliver it the way you did. Uh, did you like talk with them a lot and know some of the backstory or anything to it before you really got into singing it? All right, let me tell you the story of how we got to this song. So Rich and I, Rich from The Wake, the guitarist from The Wake, and I were working on music and um, I got a call from my friend in Texas, in Austin, Texas, and he was having a living room party that he had every year and he wanted us to come play. So we had set it up like, yeah, we're going to come play this party in um, this living room party at a mansion. We had confirmed with the guy and he got back to us and he said, I told one of my friends and he wants to, you know, he, and he knows that you and Rich from The Wake are coming down to do this little acoustic set in the living room. He wants to know if you'd take a request, if you'd play first by The Wake. So that's how, you know, I first heard about the idea. So what happened was that uh, Rich is actually very busy in his home life and he couldn't make the show. And I was, it's funny how much, you know, all these songs and stuff have like actual stories instead of musical stories behind them. It's just like, well, so when I heard he couldn't go and I called Dave to fill in for him, I was like, well, you know what? I'm, I'm going to do this song anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Like, so I I'm, I'm just going to do it without you, whatever. Yeah, I'm just going to, you know, hey, you know, if you want to do it, you should have been there, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah, so I worked it out, it, and when I first worked it out, it was, uh, just, I play the, the guitar on it, the acoustic guitar that you hear when it first comes in, and I just did vocals and guitar. I'm not a great guitar player, so it was only like those four notes, and that's all I had to play. And I tried to keep it really simple in case I had to play it by myself. Thank God Dave came with me. I worked it out, and we, 
and that's how it started. That's how it started. And then I was like, yeah, well, I'm going to record it too. So just be ready for that. So he sent me the lyrics, which you know, I couldn't tell what they were anyway. Another one of those songs with the lyrics, you can't tell what they are. It was guitar. It was just acoustic guitar and voice for a long time. And this is how these songs evolved. And then um, we were putting together the, the songs on the album. Everything was kind of acoustic. And, you know, that's what I started. It's like, this is going to be an album. It's going to be me and acoustic guitar. It's going to be cool. And then, like, everybody starts getting their fingers on it. And then it's like, suddenly there's keyboards. And then there's some, there's some drums over here and all this stuff. So Richard programmed the drums. He's fantastic at programming drums. And when he added that alone, I was just like, wow, this, this hits really hard. This is really great. And at the very last minute, we had, you know, we had a lot of songs for the album. And David Wolfenden from Red Lorry Yellow Lorry was going was gonna to play over our acoustic version of Heaven. And he put like 20 tracks of electric guitars on there. And I was like, this isn't going to be an acoustic album anymore. So I talked to Rich and I was like, do you want to add something to first? Because it's just an acoustic song. It's probably one of the bare bonus songs we have. It, but like the very last thing he did, like a year after we wrote it or played, recorded it, didn't write it. He added that high guitar that you hear in the very beginning and all through it. It's like that high Ebo guitar. Since then, I've talked to Troy a couple times. Fortunately, you know, I was really nervous to play it for Troy because that's his song, that's his lyrics. Fortunately, he liked it as well. You know, once Gordon got to the produce it and make it sound as amazing as it does, then he, he really liked it as well. So I was glad to, you know, come up with a version that he liked as well. I think that's beautiful. And like, it's, it's a great story on it. And I, I think there's a lot to learn from that, you know, as band doing covers now. To me, it can, it can be really hard. I know it's something that usually people do to promote your band, to throw a cover on an album or something like that. But to truly like make it your own and do justice is not an easy thing as people think. Like there's really something to be said for it. And that you actually had a chance to have feedback from the people who wrote the songs <laughs> I know, I on got the to... covers. Is... Yeah, I even, I even wrote a note to, that... um, to Michael Girard of the you know, the swans and, you know, said, here's just another cover of God. Yeah. And he actually wrote me back just, you know, thank you. And I was like, <laughs> okay, that's everybody. <laughs> I've talked to everybody I covered. So. That is so freaking awesome. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> some covers are often, you know, just an, a straight cover of the song. And some covers are more like a tribute. There's two of those two, Goddamn the Sun and, and Heaven, are kind of like a tribute to the songs, because especially First. First is so different, you can't recognize it at all from the Wake yeah. song. I like to slow them down, make them torch songy. But sometimes we do a straight cover, like, you know, Flock of Seagulls song we did with Sunshine Blind, the cover of Iran we did. Yes. Which pretty straightforward, but came out nice still. Yeah, but that was one that, like I said, I must have played until that CD bled. <laughs> So now that you have this album and have come back and have gotten all these people standing up for and appreciating it, what's next for Carolyn Blind? What's, what's the next saga in the story? And are you working on writing right now and doing more original material to put out? You know, I was just warming up. That was the first time I'd ever recorded in my own stuff and the first time I'd ever recorded my own vocals, that's for sure. And I was learning for a lot of it and I got lots of good pointers and help from Gordon. He's, he knows everything about everything <laughs> musical. And so, I mean, that whole thing was just kind of like, I figure it's a warm up, especially since there's cover songs on there and stuff like that. So now I'm warmed up. The next thing is, you know, a full album of originals, you know, and it's funny because as soon as I put out that album, like, I get a call literally every day of somebody who wants to, me to sing on their cover song. I'm just like, dude, I just did cover songs. I did them, you know, it's so last year. You I'm know? done with that, yeah. <laughs> so, yes, I'm looking forward to writing. And, you know, right now I'm in the process of moving, so I haven't had a lot of time. While I am moving, I'm still keeping busy because I'm working on an EP with David Wolfenden right now. He's the one song that we put on this album, the Caroline Blind, the Spell Between album was, did two, well, he did Heaven, and then we did an original, which was called Death to Sleep. And it's kind of more of a trip hop sort of thing. He's given me quite a few more of those to work on. And I've written a couple of them and he's putting together an EP right now. That's, that should be out this year. And yes, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit different. Go from the acoustic to the electronic, <laughs> you know, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's all experimentation. I like to experiment. I'm not confined to a box. Like I saw that um, Boot Blacks interview and I just loved it when they said, that, you know, when people joined the band that they said, do whatever you want. We're not in a box here. You can do whatever you want. And I'm just like, that's, that's really it. You get to experiment and see where stuff takes you. 
that's that's fantastic so it's all going to be experimentation to me because i've never done it before still so um yeah we'll see what comes out of it once i get set up i should be ready to go a lot of the things that i was going to ask were covered like right away like right away <laughs> right away so um but i do have one that is just kind of like a little bit more of a silly one do you have a name for your acoustic I have a name for my acoustic. Ooh. That's a good question. I have a couple acoustics now. Ooh. Um, no, I don't. I name motorcycles, but I don't, I don't have a name for that acoustic. You have motorcycles? You get cooler and cooler all the time. Oh, yeah. You haven't seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. I have a good one here. This is, this is important. So as you know, Colin, our bass player and the other person uh, in the Sounds and Shadows interview that isn't here, I don't know if he's, but he makes guitars from scratch. So if you were going to have Colin make a custom Carolyn Blind guitar from scratch, paint the picture for me of what that looks like, what the color, what the trim, what the body style, what kind of pickups, tell me about your dream guitar that he would assemble for you? It's a standard kind of Sheridan 335 Epiphone kind of, you know, arch top, black with a Bigsby. I'm trying to learn to play Ooh. with a Bigsby. I've never done it. So, uh, yeah, there's all sorts of things I'm trying. <laughs> I'm going to try it all. What kind, of, what kind of wood are we using on this? Oh, well, I don't know the difference between the woods and the guitar. I'm going to have to have teach you and go though. through it. <laughs> a 12 string you'd want? I'm going to go for a 12 string. I, I noticed that was one thing you played, I think, a 12 string when I saw you there live and you did the show. And that was one of the things I really liked. I know you just said a minute ago you're not that much of a guitar player, but I really liked the, the rhythmic style that you added in, especially with the 12 string that I think added a lot of energy to the songs. Almost kind of like the cure -ish, you know, to kind of have that like a percussional instrument. Um, acoustic aspect of it. So. I've always played rhythm guitar when I'm on stage, but um, the acoustic actually adds that mm -hmm. that extra, you know, oomph that you could use in, uh, when you're playing live, especially. Um, and the thing is, Ken, that it's hard to sing and play at the same time. I've, I've heard that. You know, I don't have much talent singing <laughs> or playing guitar, but I will say that the one talent that the gods saw to bequeath to me is from the moment I picked up a guitar at 13 years old, as good as I could play it or as good as I could sing, I could always do them at the same time. So as I've gotten better, I can do both at the same time. But that's one thing that I have no idea why, but my brain was just wired that it does that. Yeah. Well, for me, it's, <laughs> I, must be weird it's, I can do both. Obviously, I can do both because I do, but one suffers. Well, yeah. If I'm really concentrating on guitar, then Ooh, okay. the vocal will suffer. And if I'm really concentrating on singing, then I'll forget what I'm playing. So it's a battle, but keep trying. Now, so for some reason, when I play bass, that's not true. If I play bass, I'll totally screw up the lyrics and the singing and everything. I can't make the switch. But rhythm guitar, for some reason, no problem. So when we had uh, Jared Lush of Chem Lab and Dog Tablet, Martin King, uh, on to interview, we started asking, he has amazing footwear. He always has like the craziest shoes. We asked him, when you are recording vocals in the booth, do you have a, a particular pair of shoes or something that you have to wear in order to get a good take? And he was like, absolutely yes like what footwear i have on please i can't sing properly to get a vocal take unless i have the right shoes do you have a particular accoutrement that whether it's psychological or what that you need to have in order to get a good vocal take wow well you know i always play live barefoot and that came from rehearsing barefoot so ah um, okay so barefoot would is is probably something I would do while recording vocals as well. I think Stevie uh, really Nicks does that a too. Clothing thing. No. No, I mean you know those rituals like warm ups and stuff that I you know have to do, but don't really have any. Well, what's that? What's your warm up ritual? 
Uh, honestly, it's uh, I usually just sing sing along to stuff in the car and stuff with you know really good vocals that I you know either some old Jesus Christ Superstar or uh, you know something oh. <laughs> something you know show like, tunes you warm up to show metal tunes. bands with high vocals or something I don't know whatever the you know whoever has a really good voice that is a, is among my five CDs in my car so what's your favorite food? that you ever had like regional out on tour you know me like it's all about what i'm eating and where i'm going like what is when you stop off on a tour in town what is your favorite thing that you got to eat somewhere that was like a regional food that blew your mind oh wow well there's so many like you know i know Chicago, that's why Chicago, it's hard. deep dish pizza and you know meat pies yeah. in london and uh you know cheesesteaks oh. in philadelphia and Oh yes. I mean, you gotta, you gotta have. Yeah, it you're, you're getting me excited. Where do you go? Get, you gotta try it, right? I think we were in Salt Lake City, and they had something like, I don't know, it looked like a beignet or something. I forget what it was. What? Warm yeah, what the hell do they eat in Salt Lake City? <laughs> it was like it's warm a beignet. What? It? Yeah, it's some kind of like donut or I don't know. I looked it up. I was like, what's the top ten foods here? We gotta look it up, okay. and it came up with some kind of beignet i figured it i figured they just had bowls of mayonnaise in salt lake city i didn't know they had regional <laughs> cuisine of some kind so <laughs> now that you are out in new jersey yes and hopefully the world comes to some semblance of order again sometime in the near future and you can actually play out again and you with all of your friends and everybody that i'm looking here on your uh, album and all the people you have available. What would it look like if you put together a New Jersey one night super show? Who would who would you have play with you at that show? I, I bought my ticket. I'm going to see Sunshine Blind at the show. But who else is going to be playing with you on that show? An I mean, ultimate goth super show. There's so many. People, there's so many people that like all the. You know, it's all about the bands that I used to, t you know, tour and play with back in the 90s. It's it's all those guys. So, you know, it's all the Switchblade, all the Faith in the Muse, all the, you know, Nocturna, Trance to the Sun, Requiem in White, I don't know, Empire Hideous. Whatever, right? I forgot about them. That's a great one. I have to go look them up. What are they up to now? I'm going to go find out. <laughs> there are certain things you have to look up, see? At this point in my old age, it's about reconnecting with all those people I knew. We had such good times. You know, when I think of people to play music with, I think of my friends. I don't think of, you know, yeah. I want to go see, I don't want to call, you know, Billie Eilish up or something. It's like, I want to play with my friends. So. I mean, I might call her up. Like, I bet she puts on a good live show, I'm sure, you know. Yeah. Lady Gaga, we love Gaga. She, she, she seems like she'd be fun. I have one other serious question I really wanted to kind of address. So I did a, an article a little while back about modern women in goth. I don't know. I mean, a lot of music scenes obviously have kind of shut doors and gate cat and, and been a boys club. But I, I think goth, especially we were just talking about it yesterday. I think me and uh, Azzy from Obscure Undead were talking about this the other day. I think that we're one of those scenes that although we talk about being very open and inclusive, hasn't always been that way to talent. And I feel like you were, at least for me, somebody who was a a big pioneer in this who, who broke ground. I mean, sure, there was Susie Sue, you know, people like that before they had done it. But when I started looking at the list that I put together of modern ones in the last couple years that have really got me excited, and then you had this album coming out, so I was able to, to put you on there with it. Can you talk to me a little bit about what your, what your experience was like in trying to, trying to break in and how you were able to to find your voice and and be a part of this scene and not just that be, be a successful part of it even when i'm looking down the list right at everybody that played with you on this album and worked with you there's a whole lot of fucking dudes there <laughs> you know I like and I like, I like what, are, dudes. what are what are some of the ways you know that kind of affected your journey and affected the the music that that you made, why it was important to you. I think, I think, you know, one of the things that could speak to that was the fact that you, whatever band I've been within or, you know, whoever I've played with, it's like the only person I care about uh, as far as 
you know, any opinion of what I'm doing is the person I'm playing with. So, or the people I'm playing with, because they're the only ones yeah. who know if I'm doing it right or wrong anyway. You know, I always made music for my bands, with my bands. That's all I ever cared about. And my bands were like, yeah, do that. And I'm like, okay, that, that's probably part of it. You know, I, I didn't really think of it as like the girl at the band, but I've always wanted to be part of a band, you know, sure. part of the boys club. It's, you know, it, like I belong to a motorcycle club now. Totally, you know, lots of guys, lots of women too. But, I, you know, nowadays I think like, could I play in an all girl band? And I was like, I can't, I can't even conceive of like what that would be like at all. <laughs> I don't know if it'd be good or bad. I have no idea. I, I was just going to say, I, one of the things, like I said, when I see that, I feel like this is happening more. Like it was easier to come up with a list last year when I did it than it would have been if I would have tried to do the same thing 12 years ago. And, and I do think that maybe part of that is the fact that, like you said, you're going in and learning Pro Tools yourself. You're going in and engineering yourself and recording yourself. And I think maybe that's one of the doors that was harder to get through is rarely ever did I see women sound engineers. Like in all the years of doing music or looking at it, of big name ones, you could probably count them on a hand, you know? Mm -hmm. And now with modern technology and the, everybody has this in their house, anybody who wants to can look it up on YouTube videos and read on pages. And all of a sudden, boom, you're a sound engineer of yourself. So you can make the exact music you want to make, you know? And, and maybe that's one of the big changes that hopefully will evolve more and more and just open the door to more women to step forward in the scene because you just don't fucking need to deal with somebody's <laughs> bullshit to do it. You could just sit down yourself and make it yourself. Yep. <laughs> I don't know. What do I know that I'm just some dude? <laughs> I don't know. I guess you, you could be forceful enough to have someone who's recording you do what you want, but yeah, it's True. not, it's not the, it's not the norm for sure. Well, now I want to hear, Carolyn start, you know, as your engineering skills go up and you get better and better at recording yourself here, I want to see you take someone under wing and record some young lady and be hey a now, producer now. Just hold up there. <laughs> the challenge is the challenge is issue. I want to see yeah, that now. <laughs> is down. What have I done? See, this is this is the thing. It is a, it's the uh, <laughs> opportunity is an amazing thing, but it's also freaking terrifying sometimes it's like i don't even know but you know it's a challenge you <laughs> rise to it or you don't i guess and you know could happen this has been a lovely discussion i've had a lot of fun doing this and i feel like i don't know just i getting to kind of i don't know to talk through and think through this i really recommend to everybody this album was really special when it came out it just has just a fucking weight and a power to it. I get moved by a lot of records, but a lot of times it has more to do with the music, even though me as a singer, I don't know. I think that's the part that's missing a lot in today's day and age is you just don't get smacked in the face with the lyrics and the delivery and the standalone of vocals on it. And I feel like that's what this record had in spades. And I highly recommend everyone go pick up a copy. It's on Bandcamp. You have a web page too to get things on, right? Uh, yeah, there's the sunshineblind.com web page and there's the motherofsky.com. But mostly I do a lot of stuff on Facebook, so that's where it is. And just to piggyback on what you're saying, you know, it's this album was super, super emotional to make. And, I, you know, as getting the feedback as it was going along was that people could really hear it. And um, I'm glad to hear you say that you could really feel it as well. And there was a lot of tears. <laughs> it was, it was tough. It was, it was, there, yeah. yeah, everything you hear there, it's, it's real. It's real. So I'm glad to hear that it translated. This new album is so emotionally impactful and it kind of gave me moments of like catharsis where I was kind of crying along with it. And that really is something that kind of matters to me right now makes me feel a lot less alone when the world is so spread out. So I just want to say thanks for creating this art and making something so genuine. Thank you so much. Aww. So great to hear that. That's all I ever want to hear. <laughs> this has been Sounds and Shadows, uh, interviewing Carolyn Blind of Sunshine Blind. Everybody out there, keep it dark, yo. Thanks for hanging out with us. <laughs>